All right. Welcome, everybody, once again. We're kicking off our faith formation for this year with our opening series, Knowing God Through Faith and Reason. So let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to know you, to love you, to commit ourselves to you. We pray for all of the challenges that we and others around us face in our world today. We ask that you enlighten us with your light and truth, that we may have a path forward, that we can see the light in the darkest of situations. Help us to know you more and more as we devote our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, do we really need God anymore? That's not a question you'd expect churchgoers to ask themselves, but this is a question that many around us are asking, and we need to be mindful that this is actually a deeper question than we might think of. Um, it's being asked by so many people today. It does seem like we need God if we're going to have any chance at happiness with our loved ones after we die. Um, but in this life, do God and religion really help people get along with each other, or does it have the opposite effect more often than not? God doesn't matter much to many people today. Many say they haven't experienced God at all. Is God even with us anymore? Or is God just a myth we tell ourselves to cope with reality? So let's face reality head on. Society is becoming increasingly secular and non-religious. It seems like God is hardly mentioned anywhere anymore. Outside of places of worship, maybe in religious schools or organizations, and in people's private lives as believers. <clears throat> but we see so much separation of religion from politics, school, work, the media, business, science, and public life as a whole. Families are spending less time forming their children's religious values, letting them figure it out for themselves. A record percentage of young people are disaffiliating from organized religion and many were raised non-religious to begin with. Society often seeks consensus, either what they should do or how they should govern. They seek this consensus apart from God. Since so many of us who live in society disagree about religion, we like to take the path of least resistance and embrace the values of our secular culture which you know, are sometimes good and noble, but at other times are vulgar and not so good. And this is the water we've been swimming in for years. Our culture has slowly turned up the heat, and now we're boiling. Have you noticed? So let's think a little bit about what this is really like, living in a world without God at the heart of it all. Yeah, the way I look at this is we need to take a step back and we need to think about who we really are as human beings. Because our answer to that question and our understanding of who we are as human beings determines how we answer these questions, how we, and, and all the good questions that are part of this series, you know. Um, does science prove our faith? Uh, is God real or made up? Um, it really comes back to our understanding of who we are and what it takes for us to live life in a reasonably fulfilled, healthy manner in which we have um, what we need to, um, to not just get by and to live, but to thrive in our world today. Okay, so who are we as human beings? Well, there's two really ways of looking at it, and I, and I use the general term worldview. There's a secular worldview that we swim in that Michael just kind of described. Okay, that's really kind of answering whether we're conscious of it or not. It's answering the question of who we are as human beings. And what it's saying is, is that you don't need God 
in order to live your life well. And then there's the Christian answer, the Christian worldview that says, no, we need God in order to live our lives well and be fulfilled. Why does the Christian, why do we as Christians believe that and say that? Well, um, because it's answering the question of who we are. And there are a number of dimensions of who we are as human beings. Um, you know, the first thing right off the bat is whether or not there's something more. Because deep inside each of our hearts is a desire for something more. More than what our world can give. Okay? So there's that, and that's we call that a transcendent dimension. Right? Why is that important? Well, when you're going along in life and everything is fine, it's easier to answer that question, do I really need God? No. No. If I, when you're going along and everything's going fine, our realization of our need for God isn't that great. And it's easy to deceive ourselves. When does it become more of a problem, more of a challenge? When we run into rough waters, when start the challenges of life, the limitations of life in this world start coming. And at that point, that's when we start really, hopefully, recognizing our need for God. Because there's something in us, that desire for more. Well, in this life, if this is all we're limited to, then sooner or later we come up against the realization, the limitations of this life, and we realize, <coughs> ooh, there's really, it's, not, it's very difficult to be truly fulfilled as a human person when we really start realizing just how limited this world is. And I'll just talk about two quick things. Um, ultimately, we want happiness, right? Everybody agrees that we're always searching for happiness. But happiness isn't something that we can grasp. Happiness is something that's derived. And it's derived from many things, but I'll just pick two at the beginning here. And we'll talk about others as we go along. But that's meaning and hope. As human beings, all you have to do is look inside yourself and think about your life. We need meaning, right? We are meaning-seeking beings by our very nature. And we also need hope. Hope is a future concept, right? It's looking into the future and it's seeing something potentially positive, meaningful, helpful, and good. How far into the future? Right? Um, I hope to get home today, have a nice lunch, spend some time with my family. That's a good hope, right? And there's also a meaning involved in that. I derive a great deal of meaning from doing those things. So that's, once again, that transcendent dimension, that meaning and that hope that I just described, which you probably have similar kinds of things, that's under that line of the transcendence. That's the temporal. That's our here and now world. And you can derive a great deal of meaning, and you can derive a great deal of hope in our world. And that's what our current worldview, society, says it, that's enough for you. That's enough for you to be fulfilled. But, once again, you, as you run through life and as you get older and you start experiencing moral life and you start running into the limitations of life, you start realizing that we need a meaning that can't be taken away. We need a hope that can't be taken away. And everything in life can be. Ultimate meaning and ultimate hope is what we're really seeking. And only those things can be found with God. They, they, they can't be taken away. And that is what satisfies. Those are the only kinds of things that can satisfy us ultimately, because that's what we're searching for in our deepest heart. So why do we need God? Well, we need God because otherwise, those deepest desires in our heart cannot be fulfilled. So that's what we're going to be delving into. So. Yeah. 
And in our world with so much false hope and mm. seeming meaninglessness, we have the good news that God is with us. God is here to provide us a sense of hope and meaning. Honestly, you know, even though we have a secular society that sort of carves God out of this public space, it's like God isn't allowed in this bubble we interact in all the time, God really can't be kept out of secular society any more than God can be kept out of the world that he created. This is God's world, whether we try to escape God or not. When we ignore God's presence around us, we undermine our true unity of purpose, our sense of meaning and our hopes, which come from you know, following God's revelation of what we can hope for. Now, when we look at our world today, you have a secular society that tries to keep God out of things, and then you have religion. Um, the concerns of two groups kind of overlap. You know, Both religion and the public sphere wants peace and justice and freedom, and we want to be happy. But you know, the church views things from a different perspective. We view things in terms of God's plan for us, that we will reach our highest potential and our fulfillment, and we will achieve our greatest hopes from God, not from the things this world gives. But you know, how can we really believe in God and follow God's revelation when so much of the world doesn't? Is it just a, a false hope that God is real, that God has a plan for us? You know, so many in this, this world, I said, don't even experience God, they say. They may have exposure to religion, but they don't really know what it means to experience God. So if we were looking for God, if we wanted to say, hey, God's right there, where would we look? Where would we find God? There's a quote from St. Anselm uh, who wrote about his own desire for God. So he wrote this in uh, the first part of his proslogium. Speak now, my whole heart, speak now to God. I seek your face, your face, O Lord, do I seek. So come now, Lord my God, teach my heart where and how to seek you, where and how to find you. Teach me to seek you and reveal yourself to me as I seek. For unless you teach me, I cannot seek you. And unless you reveal yourself, I cannot find you. Let me seek you in desiring you. Let me desire you in seeking you. Let me find you in loving you. And let me love you in finding you. This is a deep, deep desire that we have for our God. But we can't find God all on our own. If it were just left to us, we probably wouldn't believe much in God anymore at all. But God fortunately has made some efforts, of course, to wake us up to reality. Um, there are some reasons why our world today doubts this God that we're looking for. Um, in recent decades, there have been an overwhelming and there's been a widespread sense of the absence of God that God doesn't exist in modern culture. You could say initially this was brought about by the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, thinking that we can figure things out through our reason alone. We don't really need God. Um, and then, you know, things continued to get uh, more and more atheistic or agnostic through a lot of influencers who despised religion. Um, but, you know, the sense of God's absence that God is kind of an absentee father. He made us, but he's not around. This grew much stronger uh, during the 20th century when you had certainly uh, the unpredictable eruption of the First World War, and then shockingly the monstrosities of Auschwitz nearly three decades later. And by the end of the Second World War, traditional Christian piety, the sense of God being at the heart of all society, um, kind of became deflated because reality is horrible. Why would God allow this to happen? Is God really here? So um, even though the church has always spoken so eloquently of divine love and his concern for us, can we really believe that anymore when you have such horrible things going on? That's the problem of evil right there in a nutshell. And it's something we've had a particular experience of in the past hundred years. 
the church has been responding to this spiritual crisis ever since. Now, if you were to ask people, where is God? A lot of them would say, nowhere. Claiming either that God doesn't exist at all, or that he's just irrelevant to the world we live in. You know, maybe he's there, but what does it really matter to my life? What does it matter to the way things are working out in the world? As moderns, we often feel that we don't need God anymore. Many think that you know, the laws of nature, the things we know through science, provide a sufficient explanation of our world of space and time. That you know, We don't need to say, God made it all. We can just say, you know, this is the world. It came about in a scientifically observable way. They believe God isn't even philosophically necessary. You don't even need to say God exists to make sense of things. They try to explain life just in terms of the brutal facts around them. And so in a way, when God isn't thought of as necessary in our world anymore, he becomes unthinkable. Because God is, you know, God seems pretty necessary, right? God is like the be-all and end-all of all things. But if God isn't even necessary, if God isn't even relevant, God as a concept and as a reality is unthinkable. And that's why God has kind of died in modern thought. Friedrich Nietzsche uh, famously said, God is dead. How can theology make sense of this modern notion that God is dead? How can God's being become thinkable again now that he's viewed as unnecessary? He can. But sometimes, you know, we approach God in the wrong way. And sometimes when we try to share God and our love for God with other people, we don't necessarily do so in the best of ways. Um, Truly, God is not something you can prove through science. You can make efforts at demonstrating God's existence through philosophy, but the most profound way to get to God is through our faith. But where did this faith that we have come from? It's not something that is in every person's heart, sadly. But this faith did come from God's revelation to us, sending Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, and we experience Jesus through the church. In Jesus, God dies. We've said so much in this world that we live in that you know, God is dead to me. God isn't even relevant. But truly, God literally died in Christ to show us that he is truly alive. Because through that death, he rose. And through his resurrection we come to know that God is inescapably present to us. He's in our hearts. The depth of God's Trinitarian love shared among the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is revealed in Jesus. And, you know, some people don't really know what sense to make of the Trinity. It is a bit of a mystery, as you can imagine. Um, but it's not just saying there's a God and for whatever reason there's three of them, but not really. Um, really, the mystery of the Trinity is telling us something about God's inner life. It's dynamic, it's loving, and it's fulfilling. It's not just one person stuck all alone up there with nobody who cares about him anymore. God is love, God is harmony and peace, and all the things we really want in this world, God has to the full and wants to share with us. You know, when people don't find any evidence for God in the world, you know, they tell us to prove it. I don't see God. Really, they're looking for God in the wrong places. God is not a being in the world among a other bunch of other things. Like you could say, there's God in that haystack right there. Um, God doesn't just happen to exist. God is being itself or the ground of all being. He created everything. He sustains everything. And, you know, it is a bit of a paradox to think about God because God is kind of higher than anything we could imagine, but also so present to everything that exists. Um, God creates all things, and God is kind of in a way beyond all things. But the paradox of Jesus is that in our concrete living, in our existence here and now, we have God with us. We can see him through, through the church. 
We see him by the eyes of our faith. So this mystery of God, which many people say, you know, what evidence really is there for this, that God is real? Um, this mystery becomes concrete when we look at Jesus. Jesus shows us the Father's love. Jesus shows us who we are meant to be. And through Christ, God can once again become our ultimate concern. So I wanted to share some thoughts about how God has revealed himself to us through scripture. You know, God's love for us is incredible. It's really what we're all hungering for. God has lived among us and died for us that we might be brought back to God. <clears throat> Our search for God, as frustrated as many people are trying to find God, this search is not in vain. Just as a lost sheep is filled with joy when found by its shepherd, so we too delight in being found by our God. It's not just us trying to stumble around in the dark trying to find this mysterious God out there. God is actively and intensely involved in finding us where we're at, bringing this world to himself. God you know, is a trinity of divine persons, present not just up there, but in our world right now, in history, in the church, in the sacraments, and in our hearts. In the liturgy we celebrate every Sunday, God is present. In Romans 1.20, Paul says, Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been seen and understood through the things God has made. God has his fingerprints on everything, if we only have the eyes to see it. And that takes faith, but God is there. We first of all know God as our loving father, who is inescapably present to us. Not a father who's absent, but a father who's there. In 1 John 3, verse 1, we see that he writes, uh, John writes, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. There are many people who wouldn't really connect much with their own father. They define themselves in rebellion to what they think the flaws of their father might be. Um, but God, our Father, gives us an identity that is real, that makes uh, sense. <clears throat> when we see our Father through the eyes of faith. And through Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Son of God our Father, we are one family. Jesus himself said in Matthew 12, verse 50, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we are filled with God's peace that the world cannot give. In John 14, in his farewell discourse before he died, Jesus told his apostles, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. God is a loving Father. God, the Son of God has offered us a family through him. And in the Holy Spirit, we are at peace with one another, at peace with God our Father, at peace with Christ our Lord and Savior, and at, hopefully at peace with our brothers and sisters around us. And that peace is attractive. That's what this world is searching for. But I can't find it because it's not looking through the eyes of faith. It's looking through a clouded vision. Yeah, that's a great point, and I want to kind of elaborate on that. Uh, just recently, um, I was at a talk given by uh, a gentleman who, um, he was in the 1984 Olympics. Um, he was a fantastic athlete, um, and later in life, he contacted ALS. And as you know, ALS is a very uh, difficult disease. Um, but he's a man of faith, and he still, he's in a wheelchair now. He's uh, in his fifth year of ALS. They only predicted that he would be two years, okay? And he gives talks, and he's a man of faith, and more, more or less motivational talks, if you will. But here's a man who is dying. 
He lost his physical capabilities, which he treasured so much, right? So sometimes people can place their value in some of the things that they can do, whatever that is, right? But as a person of faith, he's able to find peace. And it's very powerful because here's the dying man speaking of peace in this condition. And that's the peace that only God can give. You know, my father used to say, when I was going down a wrong path, but he didn't want to confront me directly, he would say, how's that working for you? <laughs> how's that working for you? Well, the secular worldview, the way to approach life, how's that working for you in those kind of situations? Can you find peace? The peace that we're searching for? If there is no God, if, there's, if all there is is what the secular world provides? No. And how's that working for you? Um, in our world today, in terms of seeking that peace that we're trying to find, anxiety. Anxiety is in epidemic proportions in our society. Why might that be? Well, going back to what I was talking before about meaning and hope, if we live in a world where there's no ultimate meaning and there's no ultimate hope, that leads to helplessness. Because there's nothing you can do about it. And then we're, we're given our rational capabilities, right? With faith and reason. We're, we have both faith and reason in our lives. Our rational capacities can tell us our life is not going to last forever. Right? We know we're going to die. And then we also know that we could die tomorrow. We could die today. And if we have no hope, and there's no meaning, and we start realizing that, that makes us anxious. Because we could lose it like that. There's where the source of the great anxiety that we face today is one of the sources, certainly. But we counter that with the peace that Jesus Christ brings. And that is the difference. Because when you meet a person who has ALS and who is at peace, as they're going through that dying process, and there's, he's certainly not alone, you <coughs> see the difference, and it is very stark, between what the world offers us and what our faith offers us. This is the peace that we seek, and it's the only way to it. And this peace truly makes a difference in our world. God has done so much for us out of his providential love, and without that, we truly would be lost. Lost to anxiety, lost to fear, lost to a sense of who we really are. In Romans 8.28, Paul says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Without that sense of God in our lives, we have no purpose. We have nothing good or loving that is lasting beyond this life. So, knowing that God has done so much for us, how can we remove these blinders that we have in our world from being unable to see God? Why doesn't our world recognize God? Jesus told us the answer. In John 14, he said, The world cannot receive the spirit of truth because it neither sees him nor knows him. By contrast, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So Jesus said there, um, God dwells with you, and that is how you know God. God dwelling in each and every one of us is what allows us to see God by faith. And in contrast to the world that doesn't see God because it doesn't want to accept God in their hearts. Um, God does seem like an absentee father who has left orphans. But we are truly members of God's family. 
as James writes, if only we draw near to God, God will draw near to you. But if we think about it, God is so much better than us. What really does God need from us? Really nothing. But because we know of God's love for us in Christ, we know we have something to do for one another, inspired by God's love. In 1 Peter 3.18, the apostle writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness, sorry, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he, Jesus, might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, that is how our sinful human race has access to God. We've kind of cut ourselves off from God in many ways, but God doesn't care about that. God has done what needs to be done to break through that barrier. We have put ourselves up uh, before God. So perhaps we have the gift of faith. We have received that grace from God. But how can we let others know about God's presence? Because it can't just stay here. It has to spread. In Psalm 73, verse 28, the psalmist writes, For me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works, O Lord. So if we testify to the good things God has done in our life, because we have drawn near to God, that is attractive. That is what really will convert hearts. Because so many people can't see evidence of God anywhere. But if you show forth that evidence from your own life, that could make a difference. Right. And that goes back to my example of the gentleman with ALS. Um, his witness and his presentation and his clear statement that it is only through his faith in God that he has the peace, that he has the ability, that he can make sense of his life in that situation only because of his faith, that is making God present for us. Because when you see people do that, and fortunately, if our eyes are open and we interact with enough people, there's a number of people out there who demonstrate that for us. That makes God more present. That makes God more visible and tangible. That's what God gives us the power to do through his grace. And that is a very powerful example. But we need to be able to see it we need to be able to recognize it and then take it in and let it empower us by their example and by them. God making himself present through that instrument for us. And that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. We have done much in our world to escape from God, but truly God is inescapable no matter where we go or what we do. You might think of the story of Jonah, who was told by God to preach to Nineveh, but he ran away, got on a boat, sailed away, but God found him there. And uh, you know what ended up to him. <laughs> Ends up in the belly of the whale, or the large fish there, and he gets spewed out. Um, but then he accepts reality. God is on a mission with him, and he's going to come along for the ride, whether he like it or not. <laughs> Um, also, in the Psalms, uh, in Psalm 139, we see uh, that God is with us <clears throat> everywhere. And not just everywhere out here, but in here, too. Um, I'm going to quote at length from Psalm 139. You have an excerpt of that psalm on your handouts. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Uh -huh. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, 
If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let us always remember God is with us. He formed us. He placed us in this world. And through us, this apparent darkness in our world will become a conduit of God's light. And based on what we know of God having formed us, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. In one of his remarks before saying the Angelus back in 2011, uh, then Pope Benedict XVI uh, spoke of St. Augustine's insights about how God is present to us in a profound way. So Pope Benedict said the following in this address. Those who have encountered Christ in their own lives feel a serenity and joy in their hearts that no one and no situation can take from them. St. Augustine understood this very well. In his quest for truth, peace, and joy, after seeking them in vain and in many things, he concluded with his famous words taken from his confessions. Our heart is restless until it rests in God. Benedict says, true joy is not merely a passing state of mind or something that can be achieved with the person's own effort. Rather, it is a gift born from the encounter with the living person of Jesus and making room within ourselves and from welcoming the Holy Spirit who guides our lives. It is the invitation of the Apostle Paul who says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly May your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our whole selves are dedicated to God. And he concludes, let us reinforce our conviction that the Lord has come among us and ceaselessly renews his comforting, loving, and joyful presence. We should trust in him. As St. Augustine says further, in the light of his own experience, the Lord is closer to us than we are to ourselves. As Augustine himself writes in Confessions, Book 3, High God is higher than my highest reach and more inward than my innermost self. I mean, Augustine, I, that's a, my, one of my favorite quotes. I say, our, our hearts are restless unless, until we rest in the... Um, that goes back to what I was talking about, the peace and the anxiety, right? If we do not tap into, connect with, more ourselves to the Lord, then we're going to have anxiety. We're going to be restless, as Augustine said. And that is such a common thing today. It's all around us. And that should make the value and wonderful strength of our faith, the, the meaning of it, so much more profound to us. Mm -hmm. So... This is not just a false hope we have. This is not something we believe in to cope with reality. But God has made himself known to us. In Exodus 33, verse 11, we see what God has done in our past. The Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And God's offer of friendship continues to this day. Today, we see from Revelation 3, verse 20, Behold! I, Jesus, stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. We do have a friend in Jesus. But, you know, even though we have this promise from Scripture, can we be sure God is really there? Is what all we've said today just mere hopes and fantasies? The prophet Isaiah says, fear not, well, through the prophet Isaiah, God says, uh, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We have to take time to discern God's presence among us through prayer, to know in the peace that resides in our hearts, despite the the chaos of the world around us, that God is helping us. God is truly strengthening us. And we can know that from the fruits that God performs in our lives, Uh, maybe even through an experience of God's grace. And in Psalm 23, that most famous psalm, we see how God truly is there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. There is so much in our lives that we can attribute to God's work. The more we take time to reflect on that, the more we have something to tell other people. It's not just something nice that happened to me in my life. This peace is truly of God and of no other source. To bring things back to the start, uh, we mentioned how many in our world, in our secular world, do not feel God is there. God is somewhere else. Even though God may seem totally distant from us and so far beyond us, we must remember that this difference between us and God, between God and the world, that difference can be measured as God. Since God is the absolute ground of everything, God created everything, God doesn't experience himself as up there apart from us. God doesn't define himself as separate from the world. I want nothing to do with you guys, no. God is defined according to himself. And so, as different as the world is from God, nothing can separate God from the world. God himself is how you would measure the difference between God and the world. In other words, however different we are from God, or however distant from him we may feel, this does not limit God or keep him away from us. The fact that our world is broken, that there's so much wrong, that does not keep God out from our world. In fact, within this difference we perceive between us and God, God is always uniting himself to us. If God is love, a love that is magnetic and attracts us, then even when we're separate from God, we are being drawn to God. God is present no matter to what depths we go. As a human race, as a, per, as a personal human being, God will go to the deepest depths and to the highest heights with us. Because God is the measure of everything, no matter what struggles we have. God is is the be-all and end-all of all things. So, to conclude, we talked about hope. And hope concerns things that lie in our future that we haven't attained yet, but that give meaning to our lives. There is an outcome for all of those who either believe in God or don't believe in God. 
And only God knows uh, whether one is um, responsible for their lack of belief in God, uh, given the many sources of doubt we have in our world today. But for those who truly, despite evidence to the contrary, reject God, they are cutting themselves off from their true destiny of happiness with God. Paul explored a little bit in the first chapter of his letter to the Romans what the Gentiles or non-believers in God have done for themselves. They have tried to be like gods, knowing good and evil, defining it for themselves, but they have forgotten their nature as humans and become fools. They have exchanged the glory of God for their own images, their own idols, false gods. Our world does that. We create false gods and become <clears throat> fools rather than subject ourselves to God. In our world, many become impure. Many refuse to acknowledge God. And so our own sin compounds on itself and we lead ourselves into deeper and deeper darkness. And God allows that because we have made that free choice. But what is the fate we hope for? Those who believe in God have an eternal destiny with God. A destiny that isn't on pause when we go out into the world. It's not like when we go into the bubble of the secular world, we leave God out there. Instead, God is with us everywhere we go. We bring God into our secular world. It's inevitable. The world cannot keep God outside of it. God's grace is always at work in us and in our world to offer us a share in his own divine life. God has taken our ordinary human nature and raised it to a higher calling, moral perfection and happiness with God forever. God has called each of us to live a life of holiness and to transform the world into a place where God's presence isn't only real, but felt and acknowledged for what it is. The stakes are high in every moment of our lives, even while we're doing our most mundane day-to-day -day activities. We can often spend most of our time doing things on our own without even thinking of God. But honestly, everything we do is filled with the opportunity to bring us closer and closer to God. We need to develop a sense of the sacred, that there is a sense of what is most profound and holy, that we, in our work life, our family life, and personal life, have so many things we can consecrate to God. Our most ordinary of tasks that we do each day can be filled with great meaning when we are mindful of our radical and amazing calling to seek the source of all goodness, God himself. So let us acknowledge God's presence wherever we find ourselves. And let us share our faith and confidence with one another. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, we rejoice because we have complete confidence in our God. Hebrews 11, we know that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That animates us, that drives us. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says, always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope. What is that meaning that you have discovered that gives you hope? And through this, we will be transformed into something beyond this world. 1 John 3, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. That's our hope. That's our future. That's our destiny. It's not something the world as it currently exists would predict, especially as it closes itself off from God and from true happiness. But we who have discovered God by faith and are open to God through our reason, we can be fulfilled in a true and profound way. Um, so, in our next session, next week, we're going to take a look at whether God is real or made up and examine all the reasons why someone might say, you know, as great as this vision is, God really isn't there. We'll continue this theme next time. 
So let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we people of faith have known you through the many works you've done in our world, in our lives. We thank you so much for having blessed us with your presence. Help us to be mindful of those moments when we have recognized our need for you. We also, Lord, acknowledge there are times when we don't realize your presence. We act as though you're not there. Sometimes we live as though you're just not relevant. But Lord, we know that you are our true hope, our true source of life and meaning and love. We ask you to strengthen our conviction, our faith in you, that we might be fulfilled and have a sense of peace no matter the storm going on in the world around us. Help us to bring a piece of your light to those we meet, to, by our words and actions, share the depths of your love in Christ. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you.